All right, everyone, welcome. We're excited to bring back uh, NU at Noon for another exciting spring semester. Um, we have alumnus Joe here, Joe Hunt, to introduce our speaker for today. So I'll let Joe take it away. All right, thank you, Amy. Welcome, everyone. It's once again good to get away from Zoom meetings and see real people. Uh, I'm glad you're all here enjoying your snacks. Uh, Today's topic relates to computers, and if you're like me, uh, whenever there's a topic, all of a sudden I'm seeing this topic in newspapers or on uh, TV because I've been sort of sensitized to uh, seeing what it is, and I've come across a few interesting uh, articles about robotics, uh, and I suspect some of you have also. So it's always fun when we have an upcoming topic to uh, Perhaps check the media and who knows what you'll find. As I mentioned, today's topic is human censored, censored robotics. And we're very happy to have as our speaker, Professor Tader, Taskin Parter, who received a BS in electrical and electronic engineering from the Middle East Technical University in 1993. Uh, from there, he went on to earn a, both master's and doctorate from Purdue University in electrical and computer engineering. Now, currently, he's associated with Northeastern as an associate professor of electrical engineering and computer engineering, and he's principally involved in Northeastern's Institute of Experiential Robotics, uh, an institute which, incidentally, he happened to found. Now, the uh, focus of this institute is very interesting because it deals with what is called shared autonomy. That is, shared autonomy between human workers and robots. Now, while there is a lot of concern among workers in a variety of industries, that this type of collaboration will make their jobs obsolete. His recent research has shown that the, uh, this is not going away very soon, this collaboration. And that's based on recent work he has done with the seafood processing industry right here in Massachusetts. Now this work, among other things he has accomplished, has led him to be Come, Northeastern University's first Amazon scholar. Now we know Amazon's in a lot of things, but what's an Amazon scholar? Well, the Amazon Scholar Program partners university professors from around the world uh, to work with Amazon talent uh, on a whole variety of projects, typically large scale and high impact projects that relate to the professor's field of expertise. Now, the professors get access to Amazon's resources as well as an opportunity to test and apply their research results in a real world concept, context, very important. Uh, Amazon, in return, uh, gets assistance in solving challenges in its worldwide operations. So for me, the takeaway right now is maybe we should all be watching our Amazon deliveries a little closer than we already have because they could, and maybe sooner than we think, become much more interesting and perhaps even exciting. In any case, uh, we're in for a very interesting and rewarding time, so I think it's appropriate to give a very warm welcome to today's speaker, Tatter, Patter, Tuscan Patter. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be here, and I cannot agree more. You know, having in-person interactions now, you know, uh, is is um, is is great. Um, this is my return visit to NU at noon. Um, I think you know, we, we had several conversations in the past, uh, so I'm excited to give you an update on what is happening at Northeastern all around uh, robotics. 
Uh, but then I also um, have a chance to talk to you a little bit more about the, the um, uh, Amazon Scholar work that I'm doing um, um, you know, um, with, with Amazon. But I, I, I assure you, I, let me start with saying that uh, you can be sure that your packages, when you order something from Amazon, you can be sure that they are touched by a human and that they are touched by a robot, right? So that, that, uh, that, that happens, and I mean, maybe I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Okay, so my talk, I, I a little bit uh, digressed from the announcement. I call it Explorations in Experiential Robotics. But let's first, let's first um, start with what is this experiential robotics? Right? So you will not find this term anywhere outside of Northeastern yet, but uh, we did an intentional, this, the, the choices of the terms here are, are intentional. Well, everybody gets robotics, machines, intelligent or less intelligent, um, helping people and so on and so forth. But what do we mean by experiential robotics? It boils down to four elements, four E's of experiential robotics. Robots to enrich human experiences. So as engineers, computer scientists, when we were in the room, we said, oh, you know, we can, you know, I, I was uh, having a conversation earlier. I said, the engineer inside me makes me run fast and make the machines work, function, but that doesn't mean that they're helpful. That doesn't mean that they're helping us in life. You know, they're improving our our day-to-day -day activities, right? So we pay a very close attention to uh, to really are people better off with the with the augmentation of the technology um, or not? Now this is easier said than done, right? So as engineer uh, engineers, we are not really trained too much on those aspects. So the Institute um, of Experiential Robotics at Northeastern have expertise has expertise on interaction design, social aspects of robotics. Uh, are we building the right right solution for a problem, right? So uh, it's not just, you know, making the machines work, but really understanding its impact, not as an after fact, right? After, you know, not after the fact that, you know, we build the machine, it's from day one, right? So can we really uh, bring our experts and have those conversations? Uh, believe me, you know, we are figuring it out, but it takes a little, little bit more effort than uh, you can imagine to get that conversation going. But, you know, we have uh, colleagues from College of Art, Media, Design, College of Social Sciences and Humanities contributing to our project. So that's the first E, enrich human experience, uh, experiences. Second E is embody artificial intelligence. Um, I've gone through a traditional, you know, I just realized that, you know, it's been 30 years since I got my, uh, you know, bachelor's degree, um, um, almost 30 years. Um, I've gone through the traditional engineering curriculum, right? So, you know, we write equations, we uh, write models and, and, you know, make things work, you know, put things together. But machine learning and artificial intelligence, although its roots are all in the, in the theories that we developed, they provide a different way of doing things, right? So we cannot really teach a robot to handle um, every single item that we have in, in life, right? So, I mean, one example is Amazon, you know, A to Z, right? So aspires to, to, to sell um, everything that, that you want to buy, right? So the, the inventory is huge, but there is no way to, to program a robot to be able to handle every single item that Amazon has, right? Even if you, we can, you know, imagine that we can do it, right? But then the next day when the manufacturer decides to put the shampoo in a slightly different model because that was the, you know, uh, new branding um, effort, all of a sudden your, your, your um, uh, programs, your robots will fail. So machine learning is enabling us to introduce practical uh, systems where robots learn as they interact with um, objects, robots learn as they interact with humans, and so on. So the second E of experiential robots is that they embody artificial intelligence. The third E is they enable personalization and co-adaptation. Easier said than done. We all have smartphones. What do we do first day or first moment that we have? You know, we, we get them in, in our hands. We change the wallpaper. We start downloading apps. We personalize them, right? And, and this is, you know, at its best, right? So 
Imagine one day you will have, I mean, you may have already a vacuum, you know, a robotic vacuum or, or you know, some robots around. As they take on more and more tasks in our daily lives, we, they gotta, they gotta be, you know, we gotta be able to personalize them. So meaning, you know, one robot won't fit for Tashkent versus Amy, right? So, you know, how do we achieve that? That's easier, again, said than done. Uh, it takes quite a bit of um, uh, effort, and it, this is also uh, important, if, especially if we are using robots in healthcare settings, right? So in rehabilitation, in uh, older adult care, or or um, assisting individuals with uh, with disability disabilities, right? So you cannot just assume that hey, you know, I built the robot for you. Here you go. You'll be good for the next three years. Uh, some diseases uh, progress, right? So I may have an ability today that I won't have tomorrow, right? So the, the, the machine, the, the system, my augmentation uh, should co-adapt. Uh, and then the fourth E is, again, the bread and butter of Northeastern University. We energize uh, experiential discovery and learning. Uh, through this, this ecosystem that we created at Northeastern, we are providing our students, and not only engineers or computer scientists, but students from all majors with a unique experience. Uh, take it all the way from co-ops to uh, coursework, to projects, to research, um, so that they are better off as, as they take on some of the societal challenges. Okay. Um, institute vis vision is we want to be the preeminent research institute in experiential robotics. We were not known as the experiential roboticist at Northeastern. Um, and again, the idea is to augment human abilities, to provide the society, you know, to address some of the big societal challenges uh, so that we, are, we have better lives as we move forward. I'll skip over some of these, you know, don't, um, um, so what do we do? Again, we have about 40 plus, uh, faculty members who are the core members of the institute. Uh, we conduct research on human-robot teaming, um, embodied artificial intelligence, we design systems, uh, we, we uh, controllers. Um, and, and, and two critical pieces that we think Northeastern has a differentiator, or, or has as a differentiator, are uh, secure and privacy-preserving robotics. Um, again, you know, all robots, including Phones don't count as robots, but you know, our, you know, we have cameras, we have data, right? So, um, but how do we make sure that you know our robots, if they're interacting with us on a day-to-day -day basis, they're preserving the privacy, right? So, can we introduce forgetfulness into our robots, right? So maybe they they heard something, maybe they saw something, and can we make you know what is what is the sweet spot, right? So you know how much of that data is used, and then thrown away and, and things like that. And again, I wasn't trained, I was trained as a roboticist. I wasn't trained as, a, uh, as, as someone who looks at privacy, but now through the, those interactions, uh, we are looking at those. And then the last piece is really ethics and policy um, and, and potentially economics, because uh, you know, I'll talk about some of the seafood uh, work that we do. Um, it's not ethical to say, oh, I just designed this robot and it's going to do all this and then here we go, let's just introduce it, right? So there's a, there's a huge um, effort on, on, and more than effort, you know, consideration that needs to go into how do we deploy autonomous intelligence systems in an ethical way? What are some of the policy changes? Our systems are not designed for, for machines to come into our lives, right? So what are those and so on? Okay, um, why experiential robotics? I'll just go run down through this very, very quickly. Um, disruptions happen in life. Disasters continue to happen. We just went through a, a you know, a, a, a century, uh, you know, a, a, an experience where we only get once in a century, you know, a, a pandemic. Um, so future of work relies on robotics. Uh, and this is, you know, where I can talk about a little bit uh, towards the end on, on the work that I'm doing with Amazon, for example, right? So um, future of manufacturing, you know, we cannot even uh, make the things that we design, we invent in, the, in America, right? So how do we bring back the jobs that, that went out? Um, first and last mile ecosystems, right? So your streets are getting more crowded with delivery vehicles. 
um, we are traveling longer distances to reach to the, to, the, to the goods that we want or services we want, right? So, I mean, maybe in, in Massachusetts, this is not that applicable, but if you're in rural areas of America, uh, you really need to. So, uh, there, there are challenges with first and last mile ecosystems, workforce shortages. Pretty much everybody in, the, in America is employed, right? Um, so, we still need the services. On and on, human well-being, the, the, one of the most, uh, most important piece. And also the customer promise. Uh, again, I'll try to weave in some of my work with Amazon into my slides. You know, what do you want from Amazon? You know, why is Amazon is so ambitious about, you know, um, uh, about robotics and technology? When you click on your order, you want to get it in the next couple hours, right? And that's the customer promise, right? So Amazon is known to be, uh, at least, you know, it's the philosophy that the most customer-centric company, right, around the world. So day-to-day, -day, you know, uh, that was one, I, uh, one, one, one big change in my mindset. You know, when I'm running my research lab, I can think about, oh, you know, this is an interesting problem. So let's put in some resources and let's see where it goes and uh, we can spend some time on it. But then when you start working with the industry, when there's this big pull in terms of customer promise, everything becomes, is this a solution towards that problem we have, right? Are we working on the right problem to provide this package uh, that just got ordered um, on time, um, undamaged, um, so that the customers have the best experiences? Okay. Um, again, IER today, Institute for Experiential today, is recognized as Northeastern Robotics Research Enterprise. Uh, we enable the recruitment of students and faculty. This is my eighth year at Northeastern. Um, but, you know, since, since I joined, we've grown uh, by an order of magnitude uh, in terms of robotics research. Um, we, more critically, we facilitate interdisciplinary teams um, in, in human-robot teaming. Um, I talked about some of the challenges, you know, um, I don't want to skip over too, too fast, but, you know, again, aging population, providing services and care for our older adults is, is a challenge. I mean, here's the statistics. I'm working on right now with a group of um, uh, stakeholders on developing a proposal. There are four healthy, there will be four, ter four there will be four healthy adults for every individual over the age of 65 in a few years. One of them will be a child, one of them will be sick, and one of them will be far away. So that leaves one person for one person who may need the care, and then that person has a job. So what can we do to help the caregiver during the day so that um, you know, there's, a, there's a seamless, meaningful collaboration between human to human through perhaps um, a machine or a tool, you know, whatever you want to call it. Now, this may sound too far out, but then if we look at the technology revolutions that we had in the past, right? So we didn't have cars, we didn't have televisions, we didn't have cell phones, right? So every technology found a meaningful way and we adapt to them uh, in our lives. So, you know, robots will get there. Transportation, um, energy, we cannot sustain to fly to everywhere. Okay, during COVID, we got a, we got a break, okay? Uh, but uh, really, Earth does not have enough resources for us to go to every uh, travel that we want to go to, um, and so on. So, you know, what do we do with that? Uh, infrastructure, right? So, you know, uh, we sometimes uh, uh, kid around and say, hey, if we can make this work in Boston, it's going to work everywhere else in the country. <laughs> Um, and um, uh, we have an aging infrastructure, our roads, bridges, um, you know, you hear time to time, uh, you know, this building collapsed, this bridge, um, you know, got damaged and so on. And we don't have the, we don't have the human resources to maintain these, these infrastructures. Right? So that's where, again, I want you to leave the room by thinking that, hey, Tashkin is not just trying to take over jobs or, you know, build robots um, that will do everything. No, our robots are designed to augment human workers, humans, so that we can solve some of the problems that we are not able to solve um, in, the, in the future. Okay. Um, 
So let me give you a few examples, um, and then you know, we'll open up for questions and, and move on. So uh, I spent about a decade on uh, prosthetics. Uh, so for some reason, you have an amputation, and you know, the technology is there. You can purchase uh, prosthetic hands, prosthetic um, arms. Um, but then the challenge is, um, if, you, if I want to grab my coffee mug, you know, I move the hand to the mug you know, in an appropriate position, and then I either need to push a button on my phone or flex a muscle, so it's not really intuitive, right? So it's still, you know, there's that pause that makes me, yes, I'm thankful to have my functionality back, but you know, the technology is not meeting the, the expectation, right? So we identify this as a gap. I talk to perhaps you know, tens of um, amputees and their relatives, you know, friends. Um, again, certain things stuck in your mind you know, when, when, when you get out of the lab and start talking to potential users. Uh, I was in Chicago, this must be more than 10 years ago now, uh, at, a, at a workshop and there was an amputee and uh, we, we asked the questions, you know, okay, so prosthetic hands can do this, can do that. Uh, the gentleman um, said, Look, this hook works only if we didn't have we didn't have round doorknobs. Okay, so again, you know, you start with those so that you you solve the problems or or you provide the right tools to the people, right? So that's the that has been the ambition in my lab. So uh, we worked on um, on a setup where we thought, okay, an individual with an amputation should be able to work. You know, I, I got to go and do my work. And this is an Amazon, actually, this is prior to when I was um, an Amazon scholar. Uh, I, took, I took this picture. We took this as an inspiration. So at Amazon, what happens is, I'll talk about this a little bit more towards the end, but what happens is when you click your order, um, that gets, you know, through the cloud, you know, through the um, uh, communications, that gets to the system. Um, Amazon's, so there was a local company uh, that was founded more than 15 years ago called Kiva Systems. It's not too far out from here. It's, it's um, in Ro North Reading. Kiva System was the first company that brought this concept of goods to person concept, right? So we have this inventory. We are going to store everything on these yellow containers, goods that we want to sell. But then when it's time to fulfill an order, associates, Human workers won't walk the aisles to find the items. Robots will go under these pods, raise them up, and then drive to the associate. So this associate doesn't leave the station. Associates waste there. Those yellow um, bookshelf-like structures, pods, they are called pods, they show up to the associate. Associate knows, informed, which little container has the item that she is looking for in this case. You reach in and then you put it in a box, so that, that becomes. So you know, the, the one uh, here moves, and then the next one has an item that, associate, that the associate needs uh, for the next order or, or for that order. Does this make sense? Right? So um, this is the job. So this job you know, um, is, is pretty routine, pretty interesting, but then it's saving me time, because I don't have to go far out and find where the goods are. Uh, it's also more convenient, right? So whatever, whatever, whatever I need is, is fast, you know, it, it's, it's a faster way of doing the fulfillment. Uh, today, on a given fulfillment center, these are called fulfillment centers, very big warehouses, there are about five to 6,000 robots only that bring the, the yellow pods into, uh, into the associates, and then there are hundreds of associates just fulfilling the orders. So, in this research, again, not pre my Amazon scholar life, um, we asked the question, what if this person had an amputation and wearing a prosthetic hand, right? Can we eliminate some of those pauses that I just described earlier uh, by introducing some level of intelligence in the hand? Because, you know, when I have an order, when, when these yellow pods appear, I know what kind of object I'm gonna pick up next, right? So it may be a book, now, it may be a pencil next, it may be a you know, um, gift card next, and so on, right? So having that information, perhaps, will help me to eliminate some of the pauses or, or those, those non-intuitive ways of controlling my prosthetic. 
To do this, again, this is one of those experiential robotics projects that I tried to explain earlier. To do this, we didn't start with the technology. We started with understanding human motions. We work with our physical therapy uh, experts. We work with our movement science experts. And we said, OK, are there any cues in human reach that we can use so that we know when to close? Right? So when do you fail grabbing? When do you fail grabbing a, 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 a cup, right? I'm reaching, you know, we, we, I'm, we, are, we are trained on this, right? so we figured this out. But if I close too soon, I'm not going to grab it, right? And then I don't want to go and wait there before I, I realize that I need to grasp that right now, right? I mean, it's, a, it's the seamless motion that we develop, right, between us and, and, and the world. So the idea here is your robot is being carried by, by, the, by the human arm. Can we eliminate that pause? And then can we close it at the right point? And with the right grasp, perhaps, so the, the success, right? So we, we successfully pick up the object. So um, going back, we started with understanding the human uh, movements. And it turns out, here's your, you know, uh, uh, a piece of information that you may not know. I didn't know. As we reach to objects in our environment, right around the 60% mark of the distance, our hand reaches the maximum velocity. And this is pretty consistent, OK? So I'm going to go here. And at about 60%, this is where I reach the you know, uh, maximum velocity. Then I slow down, because this is how our brains, uh, we don't think about it, right? So we don't think about it. So when we realize that from the data sets that we collected, so looking, you're looking at the arms of our students who tried to do this you know, numerous times from, from numerous different, that gave us a clue, you know, clue in the sense that once we detect that peak velocity, maximum speed, then we know, oh, we are almost there. We, we need to predict. You know, we don't have to predict everything, but we can say, hey, we are 40% 40, 40 away. So adjust your aperture. Adjust your, you know, how you're going to close. Anyway, so we did some math. We did some methods. And we showed that this is doable. I hope these things will run. Yes, we also do quite a bit of. Um, uh, simulations where we do, um, you know, it's not, you know, if it's, you know, can we can we go and grab and we learn from failures. It's as if a little baby, you know, uh, interacting with with the objects that are in their environment and then learning how to grasp, uh, and eventually we end up with success. Any questions? So far, so good. Yes, please. As you're making the mechanical robot. Yep. Originally, did you use virtual robots to you know, maybe to work on the motions by a computer simulation? So we, we use simulation all the time, and we do um, we, we, um, close the gap between simulation and the real, and the re real to simulation. Um, I don't have any slides, but you know, one of our projects, just to answer, yes. So you're, in, in short, we do both, right? Um, one of our projects was on cable manipulation, right? So um, in, in big airplane manufacturing, uh, there are workers who go and route cables all the time. And that's a very time-consuming task, and that's a very hard task. Uh, so we said, you know, can we, can we have robots doing the cable, cable routing? Um, now, cables are interesting because they are flexible, right? Again, you cannot, you cannot predict how they're going to bend and so on and so forth. So going back to your question, we said, OK, so let's start with simulations, right? So let's introduce some models, but then let's, can we have an understanding of because, I mean, uh, it's not fair to have PhD students spend all their time on you know, playing with flexible objects and figure out what, what to do, right? So we, we can do intensive amounts of simulation and figure things out. And then we say, OK, now let's, we, we figured it out. Yes, you know, if a robot picks the cable like this, it can go and plug it in. We go to the real world. Right? So we say, OK, so now let's have 10 different cables two different robots, let's try. And then we realize, OK, so out of those 10, eight worked, and then two didn't work. We come back and adjust our simulation models, because you know, as you can, you know, simulations are 
doomed to work because we make them, right? So, you know, as engineers. So we go back and adjust our simulation models to, to match the reality. Um, along lo those lines, um, another, uh, another project that we are still working on um, is understanding human, human, uh, understanding human robot handover. And I usually use the um, surgery room uh, to, to describe this project, right? In the, in the surgery room when doctors and nurses work on, on, in an operation, during an operation, they don't talk much, right? So there's, there's an unspoken language, right? So the doctor does this and then the nurse knows what's gonna, you know, nurse knows the process and there's a seamless handover, right? So we basically took the prosthetic hand project and, and said, okay, now two ends are, are dynamic, you know, there are, there are more parameters, variables for us. So then we ask the question, I mean, you may just say, you know, I'm mean, thank you, you know, your taxpayer dollars are paying for all these research, you know, that, uh, you know, for, through the National Science Foundation and in other places. Um, we ask the question, can we achieve human-like handovers between a human and a robot, right? So what if one of these individuals was a robot, you know, can we still get to that level of smoothness, seamless collaboration, and so on? Now, Again, I didn't get trained as, an, as a human movement scientist, so we work with physical therapists, and then I learned a ton, right? So in, in a simple human handover task, there are four modalities, right? You can be the initiator or the receiver, um, or, 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 or you know, the follower, or you can pass it or you know, receive it, right? So you're gonna give it or receive it, right? So you know, when you make, mix and match, there are four combinations. So for each one of those combinations, we looked at biological data from the human, human handover, right? Again, you don't see a robot here, but we have cameras measuring all our um, activity, our students' activity. We are looking at the gaze, right? So when I'm handing over an object to my partner, am I making certain eye movements that, again, I'm not calculating those, right? They, they are just wired in a way, you know, in our bodies. And it turns out, yes, we do those. You know, there are cues in human-human um, activities. Um, and we, we, again, we've done quite a bit of uh, modeling. So this was an, um, so we collect data under this. So there are cameras all around capturing uh, the data. We use exactly the same technology that Hollywood uses for movie making, right? So, you know, when they introduce CGI and so on. And then we learn, we simulate, we come and look at the data and then go and, um, um, uh, you know, make it, make it work. Uh, I'll pass along some of these because um, uh, we are looking at autonomy, we are looking at underwater systems, but I want to get to the uh, seafood project because it was called out and it's one of my favorite projects. Uh, this dates back 2018. Um, I read an article on the Globe or somewhere um, saying that, hey, New Bedford uh, seafood processors are struggling because there are not enough workers. Uh, there's demand, but they cannot meet the demand. Oh, by the way, in the United States, we have a $20 billion trade deficit in seafood. I said, what? $20 billion trade deficit in seafood? You know, we have oceans, we have water, we have fish everywhere. Why is that, why is this the case? Um, and again, I think this is, you know, hopefully uh, you're getting the message, you know, I, I don't wanna sound like a broken record, but you know, I didn't read anymore. I said, I gotta go and talk to somebody. I gotta figure out if, I gotta get to the bottom of this, this problem and understand the problem. Um, and, and I did, you know, I went to South Boston uh, this is uh, such a great industry that I, I love working with because they're very open. They talk to you, you know, anytime you want. And they told us things like, yeah, sure, you know, we don't, we, so we have, you know, they're usually 30, 40 worker places, 10 worker places. Um, they say, we do this this day, we do this kind of product next day, and we cannot meet the demand because we cannot hire. Right, so uh, we cannot hire, we can hire, we cannot retain. Um, I went to um, a number of places, so you're looking at one of those videos, for example. Again, there are no robots there. Um, this is a facility in uh, Fall River, uh, and at the moment that I was shooting the video, they are sorting scallops. 
what does that mean, right? So they just bought a sack of scallops from the boat. They bring it. I mean, it's already shocked and everything, so it's clean. But then they put it on the belt. They're looking for misfits. They're looking for discoloration. They're looking for if one has a tear or if one is slightly smaller because they want to sort out the big ones so they can put the you know, higher price tag on the, on the product, right? And then what do you see when you look at that video? You see about a dozen workers doing the same task, right? So same job of looking at those you know, scallops, running after another and just pushing, sorting, and, and moving things. And then we, so all these pictures, A through H, and there I am, um, we visited so many places, all the way from Anchorage, Alaska, to uh, Seattle, Washington, to Gloucester, Massachusetts, and, and so on. It's the same problem. Right? There's a ton of inspection and grading that happens in seafood industry, um, and they are overwhelmed. So what, what do they do? In Alaska, we catch metric tons of, after metric tons of white fish. They're sold to... Asian countries, as is, they, they grab them, they uh, take them away, they process them, and then they sell it back to the globe, um, and we buy it back, right? So next time you're in the grocery store, if you, are, you, know, if you like your fish, go to the uh, frozen fish section, find one of the Pollock, you know, frozen Pollock um, packages, read the label a little bit more carefully. It'll say, caught on North Atlantic, which is Alaska, product of China. Uh, because, you know, when, you know as, as FDA rules, when something goes through a dramatic, you know, change in form and shape, you know, it needs to be product of that country. Anyway, so as, as, as the researcher in me, I said, you know, okay, so we can do th certain things here. You know, I was born and raised on the Mediterranean coast. You know, I, I'm from Turkey originally. Um, I never asked what's for dinner because it was always fish, right? So, you're, you're <laughs> um, so, um, and I learned how to clean fish when I was uh, when I was a child. So, what I'm trying to say is that cleaning a fish is hard, right? So it's hard for humans. If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to waste it. So, it's hard, uh, and it's even harder for a robot currently because you know, robots don't have this kind of dexterity yet. But looking at a piece of fish and finding the blood stains or identifying the tears or even by looking at it, uh, deciding if this is a 12 to 14 ounce filet versus 10 to 12 ounce filet is easy for a robot to do. So we took on that task. You know, I wrote a proposal to the, um, out of all the, all the funding agencies, to Department of Defense because they're interested in this from a Homeland Security perspective, right? Um, we still want to feed our um, soldiers, and you know they want to know where the source of the food is coming from. So, Department of Defense kicked in, kicked in half a million dollar over a year uh, for this project, and then the Commonwealth of Massachusetts um, found out about the project, and they said this is such an underserved industry in terms of technology. We want to give you another uh, half a million. Uh, and then we finished the, pro the, the first um, uh, prototype. I think I have, you know, yes, we, we uh, worked on really, um, so what's happening is, you know, it may, be, it may look simple, but what's happening is uh, we have, this is in Fall River, um, uh, we have the fish, so they appear in any orientation. So the robot has, a, has eyes that look down, uh, so, you know, my students are putting them in, in any different orientation and so on. Uh, so, robot figures it out, what type of fish that is. Does it have any visible damage, let's say, right? So, you know, anything that doesn't fit. And then the moment that robot picks it up using those soft grippers, it also weighs it, right? So, it also knows what size it is so that it can sort it. The other thing that we are doing, this is a safe collaboration, right? So on the little um, monitor over here, what you see is that robot has full information about where the human hands are. So depending on the collaboration, robot can avoid the human worker. So they, they are designed to come in to work next to a worker rather than replacing all the workers because there's always a difficult case. There's always a hard case that the human knows what to do. 
Um, well, this was a few years back, so we presented this to uh, Governor Baker. Um, uh, uh, you know, we, we called it a day and we said, okay, what do we do next? You know, do we, uh, are we done? So this was actually 20, this was pre-COVID, 20, 2018, 2019. Then we wrote another proposal to the National Science Foundation and they came back with, you know, two, two and a half million dollars and they said, okay, so you have a longer way and then go identify other use cases in this, in this scenario. So there's so much, so the, the, the challenge is, is, the, is not the uh, uh, work, it's the variability of the product, right? Again, it's the customer promise. We like bacon rolled you know, scallops. We like you know, eight ounce fillets, right? So it's, it's all that variability. Uh, and we've been working on, on um, this whole concept of seafood industry 4.0, factory of future for the seafood industry. And, um, well, I have to note, uh, you see five of us on this slide. I'm the only engineer. Uh, professor uh, Klokel is an interaction design professor. He comes in with, Tashkan, you don't need straight conveyors. You know, if you make it circular, that's a better interaction for the human worker and so on and so forth. He looks at it from a totally outside the box uh, perspective and that triggers our engineering designs in a much more different way. Uh, Alicia Modestino Sasser is a, is a labor economist. She looks at it from the labor workforce perspective as well as the business perspective. You know, she's the one who's gonna tell me, look, unless your robots are good enough to free one worker in that line, no business is gonna pay for your, for, for your robot. Um, when COVID happened, we started getting calls from our stakeholders, our um, uh, you know, local companies, because you know, no one was coming back to work, right? Um, they said, what do you have ready? Do you have anything ready? We said, okay, you know, let's, let's chat. Uh, but then we were able to get additional funding from the government to study the impact of COVID on, on this industry. Surprisingly, they prioritize technology investments um, and the ones that are still ongoing are the ones who found the technologies to keep the business going, to augment the human workers. Um, lastly, John Basel is an ethics professor, philosophy professor. He tells us, look, not every solution is ethical in, in this setting, which is, which is again, uh, a great. And Kemi is uh, totally on the workforce development. You know, if you're gonna introduce a robot next to a worker, you're gonna provide an educational, um, experience for that worker so they, they upskill their, um, um, their skills, right? So, you know, upskilling. So, all good. This is still ongoing. We are still working on this project. We envision the seafood industry 4.0. This is a busy slide, but, you know, the boat comes into this um, in the middle, you know, our envisioned um, uh, seafood manufacturing plant, processing plant, and then we have a ton of things in there, right? So, we have processing, we have worker wellness, we have a uh, little kitchen area, little restaurant where they do recipes and, and it all augmented with technology and robots. Um, one, uh, oh, I hope it's, this is, this is not gonna run, but uh, one thing that we did was uh, we looked at, we combined the handover project. If you remember, I talked about handover with this because not everything is slippery, spiky, and, and <laughs> wet in, in, um, in uh, seafood industry. One idea was if we are, so these boxes are standard frozen fish blocks. Uh, they're about 15 pounds each. Uh, and if I get a pallet of this in my facility, a worker goes all the way down, all the way up to unload them. So we asked the question, can, is there a more ergonomic way of doing this? You know, can we present the box to the worker at a comfortable height so that you know, he or she doesn't have to go through all the, all the uh, body movements? Uh, and then we, we, we validated this. Our next challenge is, uh, which, which we are working on uh, this right now and we are making some progress. So hopefully next time I'll be able to show you some robots. So big fish processing, okay? This is tunas, swordfish. Uh, they are 200 and 300 pound each, very expensive product. 
It takes about 19 months a worker to get fully trained on how to process a big fish, 19 months. If you don't know what you're doing, you're wasting the product, okay? And companies don't like this. So there are multiple companies in Boston area, they share one worker. So the same worker goes to company A this day, company B next day, because you know, they, they line it up, right? This is yet again uh, another, another interesting work. So there's no one robot that can do everything because you know, there's washing, there's cutting, there's portioning, right? But the concept here is can a robot augment the human and, and a novice processor, right? So we just hired someone day one. Um, can a robot train? the person, right? So we will never put knives on our no robots. So let's just, just, just be clear on that. Um, but uh, the idea is, can the robot guide, we, we can show cut lines, we can show steps, right? So we can say, wait a minute, this is not the right way of um, handling this, you know, this is, this is the best orientation and so on and so forth. Those are all, all doable, uh, and this is what we are working on. Uh, we worked on, uh, during COVID, we worked on um, uh, 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 PPE, medical grade PPE production. Uh, I don't have time to go over these. Um, we worked on drones for uh, infrastructure, but uh, okay. Let me, uh, let me get to this point, but I wanna, I wanna give you, I, I cannot show slides on the work that I'm doing at Amazon at this point, but you know, we'll, I'll tell you roughly what, what I'm working on and then I'm happy to answer your questions then. When you order your, your favorite shampoo or, I don't know why I'm, why I'm talking about shampoo today, you know, <laughs> maybe a maybe, maybe, uh, um, snack. Um, what happens is you, know, you saw one, one snapshot, right? So you know, uh, that goods come to the associates and associates grab them and then put them in a box. And then that the, the, the journey begins with that box. So then that box travels, and this is a, so there are about 30 of these big warehouses all, like, all around the country, but they are, you know, they are far away, right? So the, now the journey is, how do we get that box to your front porch in a day, right? Um, <clears throat> what happens is, so all the, so there's, there's a sweet spot. As you can imagine, there's a lot of data and there's a lot of optimization that goes, goes on. Uh, Amazon knows, you know, um, when, we or, when we fulfill this many orders, we can put them in a truck and send them to a, to a middle mile location where things are sorted based on your um, zip code, right? Because eventually we are gonna deliver a number of products or, or packages in, in the same neighborhood. When your packages are sorted to the zip code, they are put inside another truck, and then that truck takes it to a distribution station near your um, uh, locale, okay? So I live in Westboro, Westboro, Massachusetts, uh, and there's a distribution station down in Bellingham uh, where they got all the uh, packages, about 70,000 of them per, per day, 70,000 packages that will be distributed, you know, from Needham, Dedham, Boroughs, you know, in that region. And then there's another one which covers another region. There's one in Worcester that covers Worcester area and so on and so forth. So my current research with Amazon starts at that distribution um, station where we have packages. We know those packages will go into a van and um, they will be delivered to your door. The challenge is um, how to load the packages into the van, right? So on average, each vehicle, each van carries about 270, 300 packages per day. So that those need to be um, sorted and put in the van. Then as the driver takes off, right? During the day, driver spends more time on putting the package on your uh, porch than rummaging through them, right? Because, you know, I mean, now I have this pile, I gotta find the right package to deliver. So, Last mile all of a sudden becomes the bottleneck in that you know customer promise, right? So can we deliver on this in, on on one day, you know, in, within 24 hours? If we don't innovate in that in that 
from the packages, for, you know, 300. So it boils down to those 300 packages being organized inside the van and, and being delivered. So, um, I mean, it's not just Amazon, you know, any uh, last mile delivery service are, are looking at this kind of problem right now. Um, and the, the questions become not only the question is, how do we introduce some sort of robotics when you don't have much space inside a van? Vans go all around and it's continuously moving, right? So if you, um, uh, if you did any rides, how do we achieve this? How do we provide the solution? Oh, by the way, your profit margin is so little, right? So, you know, I mean, whatever you do inside the van should be economically justified so that, you know, you're not adding to the shipping costs. Um, this is again all about, so there, there will always be a driver, right? Because we don't have autonomous vans yet. There will always be a driver, there will always be a, so how do we augment the human driver so that the delivery is faster, uh, mistakes are less, less, and the damage is less, right? So um, along those lines, we are looking at a number of uh, technology solutions from you know, sorting the packages inside the van and making sure that you know, they, they appear at the right time and location to the driver so the driver doesn't have to think too much about or, or sort through too much about of, of, of a pile. Um, are we there yet? No. That's why they need scholars, right? So you know, if, if the solution is six months ahead, you know, they don't need research, uh, they can go and implement it. But, you know, we are looking at the last mile delivery maybe in the next three to five years um, where we can make, we can introduce efficiencies. All for the great customers that, uh, you know, Amazon has, obviously. I think with this, I'm going to open it up for questions, ask away, you know, a lot of questions from what you saw and, you know, maybe, you know, what I presented inspired, you know, other applications. I'm happy to have a conversation now. Thank you. I just introduced the, this is just for the live stream so people can hear the question. Yeah, just a comment and then a question. The comment, I noticed you parked an Amazon truck right bes behind you out there, I, did, I didn't know if I didn't know if that was done on purpose. That was all planned. <laughs> that was all planned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for those who are live, yes, there's a there's a you know in the local uh, there's an Amazon uh, truck right there out there. Yes, this is this is really what we are looking at. You know, looking at the back of the van and if there is a technology solution to improve the efficiency of the deliveries. Right, so the, the, I guess the question is, could you comment on the business of the talk? I've heard about maybe, repla maybe replacing trucks or augmenting them with drones or something. Do you have any comments on that? that That's a very, yes, yes. Um, Amazon has a unit which is known as um, Amazon Prime Air, and it's looking at um, unique drone, you know, aerial system, um, systems for, for logistics. Um, now, Will it make it to the level of, hey, you know, in Boston, on Beacon Hill, you know, there's a truck and then, or, or you know, um, um, or, or a drone just carries one or two packages to a, a home. Um, only time will show, uh, partially because um, now there are technology challenges that needs to be overcome. There are policy challenges that needs to be overcome. And there is still the customer promise, right? So is that the solution to, to meet the customer promise? So it, only time will show. Um, I don't think that it will happen in the next five years. Um, but, you know, what comes after that, I don't know. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. The Economist magazine had an excellent special session, section about robotics and AI and business. Yeah. And one of the things they mentioned was that when you put robots in a line with workers, Correct. a potential issue, you mentioned a little about it, the problem is if the robot outperforms the worker, that puts stress on the worker and that can ruin the workplace. Yep. Excellent question. Um, well, the question is you talked about it a little. 
so we, we call it, uh, so we have a term for it right now because uh, as I mentioned in the seafood, seafood example, uh, we call it productive inconvenience, okay? <laughs> uh, the, the idea is exactly the same. How do we know that a human and the robot is more productive or, or, um, or, or humans are better off, right? And that's where I started, right? Every time we introduce a robotics technology, the next thing that we do well, the first thing that we do is we, we um, ground the designs and the approach with, with humans, but then we also do human subject studies to really understand the impact of that technology on the human, um, human side. It's exactly the same situation with the Amazon drivers, right? So now all of a sudden I have this robot doing things in my van. Vans are pretty sacred. I, I've, been to, I've been to those distribution stations. They, they love you know, their jobs and you know, they, 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 they own the whole, this is my place, what's going on here, right? And they figured it out, right? Um, but you have a very good point in the sense that that's why you know, the first thing is enriching human experiences in experiential robotics, right? Um, it's hard to measure, it requires prolonged studies, right? We won't be able to come to conclusions by doing an experiment for a day or two. Exact, you know, one, one um, uh, example is, perfect example is exoskeletons, right? So we talk about wearable robots that may help an individual with a disability to, to, um, to walk, or in the work setting, an exoskeleton may help me lift packages that I, I'm not able to lift. Um, if, if I'm not wearing it. Now, the, that's a very tight machine-human interaction because you know, the machine touches me all the time, right? So it's supporting me. What happens to my gait, what happens to, to the way that I walk or what happens to my body if I wear something for a month, for six months, for a year? When I take it off, am I still walking the same way that I'm walking, right? I mean, similar to, it may sound too, too space, uh, science fiction, but similar to when we send astronauts to you know, the space station, body adapts, body changes, right? So great point. Um, all I can say is that we are not ignoring those problems. We are looking at those problems really carefully. Uh, with experts who are experts, you know, with, with faculty who are experts on those on those areas. I think you had a question, or that this was. Yeah. If you have the Amazon van and there's a man driver, is it would it be set up that there's a robot handing him? the next package to go? And how do they set up, do they set each van like that? Yep. So um, again, this is still a, you know, we're at the very early stages of the ideation and then and, and there are multiple thrusts, let's say. Uh, but the idea is um, that, so again, you know, going back to the whole concept of experiential robotics, we didn't start thinking about the solution before really seeing how it is done today, right? So currently, next time an Amazon uh, van pulls into your street, yes, pay attention, you'll see those big bags. So packages are loaded inside big bags because that reduces the time to load. Each, so in the distribution station, the boxes, your load is put into 12 to 15 bags. Each one has 13, 15 boxes or jiffies or envelopes, whatever you ordered. And then they also have the oversized packages. Right? So maybe you ordered a pool cleaning robot, right? So it's a big package. Um, what they do is they have to find, find the package inside those bags, right? So um, one thought process is that can we eliminate the bags and can we have a little bit more order behind the van um, I mentioned they usually de deliver, typically they, they de deliver on average 300 packages, uh, and then we know their route. There's about two to three minutes of dry time between their, between their uh, each stop. So in that two to three minute time we have, 
can we do something magical <laughs> in the back of the van that will present this next set of boxes, packages to the driver so I don't have to go and rummage. So that's what we are looking at right now. And um, look, you know, I mean, you don't have to, you know, this is a good exercise. You know, we figured out vending machines, right? So, you know, there's a vending machine. You, exactly, you have goods and, you know, you push a few buttons and then it dispenses. So we have dispensers and so on and so forth. So we are looking at um, uh, different technologies, different solutions. The challenge is, again, is not the machine part. The challenge is the variability of the packages, products, um, that's, um, uh, you know, there's white ones, thick ones. There are the ones that deform and then the shape becomes different, right? So those are all uh, nice challenges that feeds into the machine. And then second part of your question, will it be all the vans? Um, so in Amazon, we talk about, you know, brownfield operations, greenfield operations. You know, brownfield is, you know, it's being done right now. And then you know, there's no way that we can take away these vans out of the streets in the next five years. They'll continue to do it. But then Amazon also has a huge um, commitment to the sustainability. Uh, and if you are following the news, um, there's, a, there's a company called um, Rivian that is uh, building... Um, next generation delivery vans. Uh, if you look at the vans ca carefully uh, next time, you'll see the ones with round eyes, you know, more, a little bit more smooth curves. And so those are, those are electric vans. Uh, so they, they run on batteries. Uh, and the idea is, you know, as those two technologies continue to develop, maybe there will be a point where, where they will merge and, you know, the future, uh, future uh, delivery vans will look much cooler. Okay, thank you. Uh, as a design engineer in my former pre-retirement life, I had an ex the experience of not exactly physical robots, but a lot of electronic aids that I did the same function, in a sense, as robots uh, to help me in my design work. And there were automated test equipment. I could get test results on my prototypes quickly. There was computers that would solve even the most complex mathematical problems in a flash. Uh, there were computer programs that would allow me to make the most sexiest slides in the world to wow our customers and divert their attention from what was really going on. Uh, the end result was not only did it eliminate a lot of the grunge work, uh, but it allowed me to do my job much faster. I could complete my projects more quickly. Mm -hmm. And the promise in this was that with the time that was freed up, I would be able to exercise my creative ability as an engineer and think out of the box and invent all kinds of things and have all kinds of fun. Well, the result, well, the long term, initially that was, promise was fulfilled. But the long term effect was, since I could do my job quicker, let's just say in half the time that it would normally take me, that other half time, instead of being creative, uh, was used differently. Management felt, hey, if I could do my previous job in half the time, then I could do two jobs in the time it normally took me to do one, okay? So I guess my bottom line on this is that while it's certainly appropriate to consider long -term, uh, short term benefits for the worker, uh, there may be unintended co uh, consequences further down the line. Yep. Okay, so that might be one thing uh, that we perhaps should give more attention to. And finally, a comment. Is it possible that the Amazon driver could at least hit my doorbell when they drop a package? <laughs> I know it takes five seconds, and if you count how many deliveries it makes, that five seconds adds up. But it would certainly help me, and I suspect a lot of other people also. 
Great comment. You know, I, I, I don't know if they can you know, put, hit, the, hit the button. I'm sure there's a business uh, you know, rationale behind it. Um, but let me, let me put it this way. I, um, again, if you go to YouTube, you can search for Amazon driver. You, you'll see a bunch of uh, interesting scenarios that go through on a daily basis, you know, being chased by dogs and, you know, uh, um, and, and even there was one, I think, last week, um, uh, a driver delivering packages in the middle of a, you know, police, um, uh, you know, ordeal, right? So there were police cars and then this Amazon driver just walks through, drops the package and leaves, you know, <laughs> as, as if nothing is going on. So, um, but, but your point about... Um, Yes, if I do my job um, more effectively, am I going to get punished, right? So that's where the policy and all those ethical considerations come into picture. And, and as I'm saying, you know, um, Amazon also has a, has a huge uh, focus on human factors, ethics uh, pieces. But at Northeastern's Institute for Expansion Robotics, that's also our our thing, you know, we don't want to we don't want to penalize, or you know, we don't penalize someone who is productive or or efficient. Uh, the whole idea is we will get to, we are getting to point in certain industries that we cannot improve the efficiencies anymore, right? So there's not enough human power uh, left. So what do we do then, right? So because the demand is still growing, right? All right. Um, can we have one more round of applause for Task and Padir? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming, and um, we're excited to have more ex inspiring faculty this spring. So thank you very much again. <laughs>